Well, what do you know? It's Friday, and we're here for the Rapid Fire Ivy Nation Sports Talk Show. Vince D'Addario, Jesse Styers, Sean Styers. I uh, am once again in Greensboro, North Carolina, where we had breakfast basketball today at the ACC Women's Basketball Tournament. What are you pointing at, Jesse? Is that an animal? Yeah, that's Henry's head. <laughs> Are you in like a closet? Are you okay? Blink Where twice. Are if you're you? not okay. Are you in witness protection today? <laughs> nope. It's a mystery. <laughs> it is I'm a headed, mystery. I am headed to West Virginia, though. Let me ask you guys this. If um if you were working and someone just came and plopped themselves right in front of you while you were trying to work, how would you feel about that? <laughs> well, if I'm trying to work and I need that visual, visual. <laughs> I'm assuming you did, I think I would have a big problem with that. I assume you guys saw my tweet that I tweeted. I reposted it. The ACC, in its infinite wisdom, oh, decided boy. that, you know, not only do they have courtside seats for fans, which is, you know, I think we all expect courtside seats everywhere at this point. In the middle of press row at the ACC Women's Basketball Tournament, Right in front of the working media, right in front of all the broadcast positions, they have ticketed oh. fans sitting right in front of uh, of all the radio positions. And the guy that I had sitting in front of me happened to be around six foot four. Yeah. I'm, so while I'm, he was sitting down, I'm, oh, thank you, Jesse. Jesse, uh, Jesse's good with the screen shots. So here it is. If you're watching, that's your view on the YouTube. This is my view. At the ACC tournament wow. today, a head right in front of me. And then, you know, because fans are going to do what fans do, what you know, what happens over the course of the game? They stand, baby. People well, get in, people get out. And so I've got five people standing in front of me while the game's going on, and I'm trying to broadcast a quarterfinal game at the uh, ACC tournament. And then that guy, you know, I think he felt – somewhat bad about it but at some point during the game he stood up while people were getting in and out and he unplugged part of my equipment in the oh no of the podcast. Oh. yes but the acc has decided that doing that you know apparently i guess it's because their their tv brought you know their tv contract sucks so they've got to get money someplace so the <laughs> acc decided sitting fans in front of working media broadcasting get yeah. you know the game is the way to go. Like working no. media is one thing. Broadcasting the game is a complete other situation. I've been like, can I just go up? Like I'll go up, you know, be in the rafters and be better off than being behind <laughs> this guy. I mean, at least your stuff's not going to get unplugged. Yes. You kind of chopped in and out a little bit there, Vince, but I got the gist of what you were saying. It's just, uh, so then, it, you know, it got even better when I got back to the hotel today. I got back to my room after all this and the, uh, you know, the little electronic thing where you swipe your, your key card to get in your room, it stopped working. So they ha actually had to come and put a new battery in, <laughs> in it. So, because it, it was, a, it was a chore you. just trying to get back here, you know, to get ready for this fantastic show that we're doing here tonight. <laughs> And it will be fantastic, by the way. But I did have the pleasure of riding on the elevator twice today with Louisville head coach Jeff Walls, who I was on the elevator longer than him than I think he was coaching the game by the time he got ejected <laughs> today. I rode down with him on the way to the game. It was me and Sonia Citron's parents and him and his wife and, and kids. And then uh, after we got back to the hotel – you know, when I was actually going down to the lobby to get my door fixed, his family got back on and we rode down. So that was interesting. <laughs> I am a big Jeff Walls fan after today. He uh, he allowed Notre Dame to cover the spread. I started my day off with betting the Notre Dame spread. 
he gave Notre Dame like four free free throws at the end. That was really critical true. to cover that spread. Very Had true. he not gotten that technical and ejected, I don't think Notre Dame covers the spread because they take four points there, and it was pre- it was just over at that point. What uh, Jesse, you were just starting to tell us before we started the broadcast. He had some things to say about turnovers or something in the post game press conference. Yeah, I found the transcript, so um, I'm just going to read it to you. It's not too long. Uh, basically, he was asked. Uh, you know, there's a, 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 a you mentioned there's a pattern of only playing have so far. How do you fix that? You had more turnovers than field goals for a while. How do you fix that going into the NCAA tournament? And, you know, he get, he starts into his answer, and then finally he makes it to until – or here we go. They have to care. Players have to care as well. They, they have to own. They have to ownership as well as the coaches. Believe me, it's my job to get it fixed, but I can't play for them. I can't pass fake. I can't ball fake. You can't stare where you want to throw it, then throw it. Good teams are going to step in front and steal it. He goes on to say, until we get to the point where it really matters – see, this is where NIL could really improve our game, see – if I could find like five hundred dollars a turnover, I guarantee you, you wouldn't turn the ball over, and my players would care. Wow! So now he wants to start finding his players' nil money um, for every turnover. turnover they commit. Apparently, okay. And he goes on to say, after that, uh, as a player, you would not care more, Jada. If I say every turnover is five hundred dollars, you're out two grand after today's game. <laughs> well. Jada Curry is who he's talking about. I'm, also I'm, dropped like 30 points. Well, yeah, she had 26, and if not for her, it wouldn't have been a game in mm. the second half. So he, he wants to he wants to hit her for the turnovers. Is he, is he going to pay her for every point that she scores or, you know, whoever <laughs> right. else as well? So, I mean, I just shoot, thought it okay. was a crazy take. All 500 right. bucks a turnover is a lot, especially if you're a guard. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, especially in basketball. Like, turnovers happen. Yeah. I get it. But, like, oof. Just All brutal right. to say. Brutal to say out loud. No kidding. Man. No kidding. We'll have more on uh, Notre Dame's win over Louisville coming up here in a little bit. We've got plenty of football talk for you, though, to get things going tonight. Do you want to talk some Notre Dame football, guys? Always. All right. That's that's the big ticket right there. Let's do it. So we've got a couple of different uh, football items that we are going to talk about today, starting with Marcus Freeman from his press conference after yesterday's first practice of the spring. He had this to say about his offensive line. Oh, I think you have some guys that have started games. Um, you know, even Charles Jagasaw started a game. Uh, but but you try to create as much competition as you can, especially in the spring. We know we have to solidify positions as we go into the fall, but um, we want it to be competitive. Uh you know, and I hope by the end of spring we'll be able to say, okay, here's probably the the guys you will see as the starting five. Um, but I believe you have six, seven, eight guys that are all going to be pushing um, to be the, the the top five. So six, seven, eight guys are going to be pushing to be there in the top five, is what Marcus Freeman said. So as of yesterday, here's what the first team looks like on the offensive line: Charles Jagasaw. At left tackle, Pat Coogan at left guard, Ashton Craig in the middle, Billy Shrouth at right guard, Tosh Baker at right tackle. Over, under, two and a half of those guys who will still have those spots at the end of the spring. Vince, we'll start with you. You were there yesterday. I was there yesterday, and I will say I'm going to take the over. I think that... If you set the number at four and a half, I would have taken the under because I think there's going to be potentially one difference uh, moving. I think I think they could potentially change up a guard out of that five. So I, I but I think the rest will stay intact. I think the rest will be because, I mean, tackle, you just don't have a ton of options. And so I think they're going to stick with those two guys at tackle, at least to start the season, especially coming out of spring. I, I Ashton Craig is going to be the center. And I think Billy Shroud proved that he's the man. He's he, I think he's the best guard on the team. And so I think the other guard spot, it could change. I was getting ready to ask you. You were, you were really high on Billy Shroud. I think it was either earlier in the week or last week when we were talking about the line. So you think he is set and Pat Coogan is maybe like when Rocco. How did Rocco look yesterday? 
by the way. It sounds like he was there. Was he practicing? What's what's his status well, right now? So that is I saw him, or at least I thought I saw him. Oh, uh, so it's a mythical Rocco Spielberg well, that people saw. <laughs> so we were doing the show yesterday, and I, ghost I, said, of Rocco. <laughs> I, I said Rocco was out there with the second team, and then Ty Chan took over for him in the second team. And Brian was like, I never saw him. I don't think he practiced. And I was like, you know, if we're taking my word or Brian's word, nine times out of ten, I'm going to go with Brian because he sees, like, literally everything right. that's out there. He's the eight-eyed raven. Yes. Yes. But I felt like I – Saw 50 at right tackle. I mean, excuse me, at right guard. And so I feel like he was there. He was with the second team. I thought who I thought was him. I thought he looked good, good enough, right? Um, I think it's going to be a battle between him and Coogan for the other guard spot. That's how I think it's going to go down. But, you know, we'll see. And he said, and Brian said. Now, now is this by the end of spring, though? Or is this by, like, you know, in training camp at some point next fall? I guess. To me, it would be by game one. Okay. So after spring, Pat Coogan will probably still be the guard because I don't know how full go right Mako is after his surgery and all that stuff. So right. There you go. Okay. Over under two and a half guys that get replaced. Is that what we're saying here? No, two and a half that uh have their spots, their same spots. I'm gonna take the over as well. Um, and I think that the the way I would kind of frame my argument here is the positions I feel the most confident about. I feel most confident about Jagasaw at left tackle. I feel most confident about um, Ashton Craig at center. And then I also feel most confident about Billy Strouth at guard. The, the spots I'm most or least confident about would be right tackle and left guard. And I guess – Vince, if you saw Rocco Spindler or the ghost of Rocco Spindler <laughs> at practice, I mean, I don't think it's um, off the wall to say that, you know, he could end up at that right guard position potentially. And, you know, Shrouth on one side, Spindler on the other. I don't know how, you know, accurate that might be, but I've, I feel good about three of five. There's only two that I'm a little questionable about. I mean, I think the biggest surprise really – Last year, breaking camp was the fact that you had Coogan yeah. on the line and not Shrouth. And then 100%. by the time, you know, Coogan stayed out there all season. And by the time, you know, when Spindler got hurt and Shrouth came in, Shrouth, you know, maybe he just kind of, you know, he was like, this is my opportunity and I'm going to make the most of it. I'm not, you know, uh, if, you know, if, if you want, you're not going to take this opportunity away from, he seemed like, probably the most physical guy that they had out there by the time he was, you know, out there on the field, making the most of that opportunity, which, you know, give him, give, give that to him because a lot of guys say, Oh, I didn't get a chance or whatever else. Well, you get the chance. It's what you do with the opportunity. And Shrouth yeah. made the most of it. And I agree. I, you know, like, I think, I think he is a lot to be out there someplace. So I'm, you know, I'm going to go over as well. I probably set this too low. I probably should have said three and a half instead of two and a half, but, I, you know, what happens at that other guard, especially when Rocco is healthy? You know, my question was by the end of spring. So I think, you know, that probably makes it even easier. I do wonder kind of at that right tackle, does Tosh Baker hold on to that? You know, where exactly Emil Wagner is, yeah. you know, all that different stuff. But, you know, again, that's those are some things that we're going to get the chance to see over the course of the spring. So. Uh, I think Jagasaw is set, and like you guys, I think Craig is set at center, and Shrouth is going to be set someplace. So that's easily three right there. Yep. Okay, so we uh, we mixed it up a little bit here yesterday on the subject of the quarterbacks, and I don't know how much. Ah. I started to watch some of you and Brian when I was working yesterday. There were so many things going on. Like I get you know, it. The fact that we don't have ACC network here, in, you know, on the cable in the, in the hotel room. So for the ACC tournament. Yeah, at, exactly. At yeah. the ACC tournament. You know, so I was trying to track that down, trying to listen to you guys, trying to do other work and, you know, all this other stuff. But um, so we spent some time talking about Riley Leonard and Steve Angeli. And we at least had, you know, a little spirited disagreement on what this is going to look like. <laughs> as we talked about the quarterbacks yesterday. So let me just ask you guys this. 
Do you think Steve Angeli can outplay Riley Leonard this spring? Vince, go ahead. I I I, I talked to a good amount about this yesterday, so <laughs> I you? will reinforce. Let's get the probably Vince what take. you say. See what Vince has to say about this first. Um, no chance, zero <laughs> chance. I don't see that happening in any way, shape, or form. Um, watching all four of the quarterbacks, I mean, he is the least gifted of the four. There, I mean, no, there, and that's not even a debate. That's just facts. Watching guys throw the football around. You know, does he have more experience? Yes, than the other two guys. Um, I honestly, you know, Jesse and I kind of talked about this <clears throat> in rapid fire the other day on Wednesday. Um, you know, we were talking about surprise headlines at, by the end of spring, I believe. My surprise headline is that Kenny Minchie is the number two quarterback, like that. And I absolutely think that could that could happen. Um, I just. Yeah, I, I don't see Steve Angeli fighting for the starting job in any way, shape, or form. See, and that's, you know, again, like, and you were there at the press conference, and we played a couple of the mm-hmm. clips with him talking about what's going on with the quarterback. You know, like he was asked about C.J. Carr, and he ended up talking about the quarterback competition. And he mentioned the competition. Like, he says it's between Angeli and – um, Riley Leonard, and then right. you know the other battle is for three and four between Minchie right. and Carr, and I, I I think we all pretty much agree that the true competition here is really what's going on at two and three, you sure. know, more than it is one versus I, two and, yes. and three versus four, right? Hundred percent. That's the way I see it. Now, yeah, you know, we all know that there's going to be a narrative that's out there that there's a quarterback competition and all of this stuff, and there just isn't for the, for the one spot, the the quarterback competition is however two, three, four is going to shake out. And I do think that should be, or is, I don't know, maybe there's a difference that should be legit. Like that should be a legit quarterback competition. Um, You know, Kenny Minch, has been in the system for a year, right? So he should have every opportunity to be the number two guy. And, you know, from a strictly, you know, this quarterback is better than this quarterback in my eyes. Like Kenny Minchie's the better quarterback. And Angeli had had it on him because he was a year older and all of that. But Steve Angeli did not. He looked very, very, very mortal. Now it was one practice. It was one practice. He looked very mortal in 11 on 11. And he was he was doing his best Ian Book impression of Captain Checkdown. I mean, he was everything <laughs> that was short. That's all he was taking during team. Now, I didn't watch him during one on ones and like, uh, because I was worth the defense. But once they got to seven on seven and 11 on 11, he was captain check down, man. So the other guys were pushing the ball down the field with accuracy and success. Vince, would you say that competition can still be? these guys pushing themselves to be the better, the best version of themselves, right? Like Angeli and Menchie can still compete and push Riley Leonard. Right. Sure. But it's, it's, it's not a, a competition on who is going to be the starter. It is just a competition in the fact that they are all competing every day to get better. And, and like we were talking about yesterday, everyone's back to ground zero at this point. It's a new offense for everyone. Yes. He, that was the leg up. And had for a little bit was right. He, yeah, did right. It, he knew, he knew what was going on, but it's, it is a new system for everyone. And so when you talk about Angeli just checking down, I mean, that's that's the proof right there. I, I mean, and again, it's the first spring practice. I'm not expecting him to know, you know, all these routes and everything, but an uncomfortable quarterback checks down in those periods because that's the safe play. He's not going to push the ball downfield and allow yep. the, uh, the defensive side of the ball to win the period or win the seven on seven or win the team. And so, like, that's that that's all I needed to really hear. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And to me, just what you said, like we talked about yesterday, Jesse, the fact that it's not just a new offense for Riley Leonard, it's a new offense for the other guys as well. That to me is like the only way that maybe Angeli would have a chance to outplay, you know, Riley Leonard or any other of the other quarterbacks is because of that. But at the same time, to me, the fact that Riley Leonard has so much more experience than any of these other yeah. guys, that to me gives him the biggest leg up, regardless of the fact that he's learning a new offense, you know? So I just, I don't see any way that 
that that's going to happen this spring. Right. I don't right. see it. No, I got I, something it, yeah. uh, to share here too real quick. And, you know, like Matt, the, I put that comment up there where he says Steve Angeli can play. Yeah, he can play, but can he outplay <laughs> Riley Leonard? I mean, that's that's the question. You know, can he play better than Riley Leonard? And I just Look, – it's not a knock on the kid. Like, right. yeah, you know what? A, a Steve Angeli-led Notre Dame team is a 10-win team. I mean, I, I do – I feel that way. And a Steve Angeli-led Notre Dame team is not winning a national championship. And so if you think that this team has national championship – aspirations then i'm sorry you don't want steve angeli as your quarterback and maybe people aren't going to want to hear that and that's fine i have no problem with that but i have to go with what i see with my own two eyes and what i see with my own two eyes is three quarterbacks that are more physically gifted physically talented than the fourth one i mean it, it, yes steve angeli is a gamer you know he can play he can do all these different things i just I would be ecstatic if he was my quarterback at Miami of Ohio or maybe Northwestern or, you know, those kinds of teams. He's just not a championship level quarterback. It's okay, but that's just who he is. He's not a difference making quarterback. Right. Especially in the games that matter. The games that are going to come down to better quarterback play. He's a good quarterback, but if you truly aspire to a national championship, I just don't think that, you know, he's, I think he's a notch or two better than Drew Pine, but I, I think in, as far in you know in terms of true, is this a guy who can take you to a national championship? I don't think that that that's what you know that, that yeah. that's the description of Angel. I, I told I told Brian we were walking out of practice and we we're walking to the car and I said to him because like my, my son wants to go to Miami of Ohio like that's what that's where he wants to go right and I said look if he ends up going there. And I find out that Steve Angeli is transferring to Miami, Ohio. I am ecstatic that that's happening <laughs> because I think he would be a great quarterback on that team, a great quarterback on that team. I just don't want him to be quarterback in Notre Dame. It's just it's a different. It's a, just a different level. It's a different level. Do you think we're finally seeing seeing the turnover in quarterback production at Notre Dame? Like, do oh, you yeah. feel more confident yeah. about the quarterbacks than you did four years ago? Yeah, not, it's starting with Kenny Minchie. Like that's yeah. he's he's the leg up. Compa- like, you know, and again, I'm not trying to rip Steve Angeli, but I, I just feel like Angeli is more on par with like Ian Book than you know. Again, like Kenny Minchie, Deuce Knight, <clears throat> any of these guys that we're talking about. Who are CJ being, Carr, who are, CJ Carr. Yeah, thank you. I almost <laughs> forgot. We, you know, but like, yeah, that's. There's there's a different level, right? I think they're That's, not going to the portal next year for a starting quarterback, right? They're, they're not. The the recruiting in Notre Dame is such that at the quarterback position, where that is not going to be the case. Now they may go to the portal for an arm, like if one of these guys transfers out, that's a possibility. But at the end of the day, they're not going for a starter, like they were going for a starter this year. Mm-hmm. And and by the way. The fact that they went and got Riley Leonard should tell you everything you need to know about what the staff thinks of Steve Angeli. They, they don't think that he's <laughs> right because you're not going out to get Riley Leonard. If you thought right. that Angeli could be that guy this year. Correct. Third. It, this is the third year for Marcus Freeman. And, and, and as we've seen, the third year is a very pivotal year for, you know, traditionally sure. for Notre Dame head coaches. This is a, this is a huge year for Marcus Freeman and, that's a big part of why they went out and got Riley, Riley Leonard. This I year. think Steve Angeli, like Vince said, would be a very good quarterback at Miami of Ohio, you know, a similar type program. But if Steve Angeli is at Notre Dame, I see him as, and again, this is not to be offensive, but he is a great placeholder as this, as well, the quarterback room is transitioning into something else. And there's nothing wrong with having that role on a team of, he can still be a very good and quality backup and also be a good placeholder while some of these younger guys develop because they are more talented than him, but they, it's just going to take them a little bit longer, right? And so him as a placeholder between the young guys who are developing and Riley Leonard ahead of him, who's going to be the better you know, overall quarterback, I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah, Michael, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with this, <laughs> that Ian Book – 
I mean, you talk about, you know, we're talking about captain check down and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's what Jesse was talking about, how comfortable is the quarterback? There was a re, you know, like <laughs> what was the biggest knock on Ian book, all the check downs. Right. Yeah. And like, and I would even, you know, I, I wouldn't even limit Steve Angeli to, you know, like we keep saying Miami of Ohio. Like I, I think you could put him in a, in a mid tier you know, Big Ten sure. type program, ACC Purdue. program, yeah, and like he would, Absolutely. he could lead those programs as well. But I, I'm just, you know, again, this is, it's it's Notre Dame. You're not in a conference. Your goal every year is national championship, and I just don't think that that's where he is. Right, right. He and I thought that when they drafted him, or not drafted him, when he signed, I thought that when he signed, and I still think that today, and I've seen him play multiple times. Seen him, obviously, in games. He did a great job with the situation that he was put in in the bowl game. There's no doubt about that. But, again, that was a bowl game of depth. Who had the best depth? That was not <laughs> – That's what we elite. talked about yesterday. Yeah, Oregon right. State's defense was depleted. That was a B was, team. You can't draw any conclusions. Game. Yeah, that was not an elite defense that he went out there and did what he did against. So, yeah, not great. I concur. All right, so we had Notre Dame women's basketball at the ACC tournament today. You can put that up back up there on the screen if you want. I don't know, or was that a mistake? Saw you, saw you at the women's ACC tournament today. Couldn't get down to the court level, but cool as heck seeing you do your thing from uh, Byron. Thanks, Byron. If you're around tomorrow and get close, Paul, our buddy from Connecticut who brought me the cookies last week, he came by and said hi before the game today. Nice. So it was good to see Paul. You should Once use again. them as your ushers in front of you. One guy on one side, one guy on the other, Seriously. and say no one should pass. This I is mean, the IB. Here's the team. honesty of the situation: if they're gonna let fans <laughs> sit in front of me, I might as well just like let's 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 just do an IB meetup, and I will walk in with my posse tomorrow, <laughs> and we will just we will just roll up on on press row <laughs> before the game. I'll have my entourage come up with me and we'll throw it down and, and and they can just shield me from all these other people who are sitting down there on press row in their ticketed seats. Thanks for the super chat, Jack. He said, listen to the call today for the first time in Texas. Go Texas. He said, uh, will you be doing the tournament games for women's basketball? Of course, every game for Notre Dame women's basketball got the call. Karen Keys with me okay. today and she'll be with me um, through the remainder of the ACC tournament as well. So uh, TBD, just in terms of whether or not she'll be there for the NCAA tournament, I think it m might depend on, you know, where they end up and all that kind of stuff. Josh says, listen to the game on Odyssey at work. It was great. You and your partner, great. Love how excited you got. Pump me up. Glad that we could help. You know, those 11 a.m. games <laughs> are uh, a little bit ball. different. A little bit different. What's that, Jeff? Some breakfast ball. Ooh, man. Louisville looked a little rough waking up this morning. Uh, yeah, you're right about that. So fill in the blank. The women's basketball team 77-68 to win at the ACC tournament in the quarterfinals today over Louisville was blank. Jesse, Expect you want to lead us off? <laughs> you're going to have to repeat it. I got caught up reading a comment. I'm not going to lie. Okay. The women's basketball <laughs> win over Louisville was blank. The women's basketball win over Louisville was a testament of – what's the word? Endurance. Because I thought that they – in the second half, they were really, really challenged defensively. And I think that they weren't anticipating some of the switches that Louisville made defensively in the second half, and it tested their endurance. And I think that – Usually, well, not usually, we've seen this under Neil teams before. They have struggled in the second half when teams start playing press and man, and I'm glad that Notre Dame was able to survive because I didn't want to see another collapse at the end of a team defensively kind of shutting them down. It sounded like they were um, passing off the switches a lot in the second half, and that was giving Notre Dame a ton of trouble. So I commend them for enduring that game, finding a way to, to, to tough it out, essentially, hitting some key shots when it mattered. Well, I'll be the Debbie Downer here and I'll say it was expected and too close, <laughs> at, too close at the end. Uh, that That's how I felt because that 22 point lead dwindled fast. I think it was, it got as close as a three point game towards the end that I was watching while in the cafeteria, you know, keeping an eye on things. 
uh, but I was watching the game instead. Um, but no, it got too close at the end. And you're right, Jesse. Uh, their head coach getting kicked out pretty much gave the Notre deal. Dame a point. <laughs> I, I I was never worried that Notre Dame was going to lose. I, like I never got that feeling. When it Maybe. got to three, I was a little worried. I'll tell I, you that I, much. <laughs> I understand it. Uh, After but they got I, up by 22. Just yeah. in case anyone didn't know the story, they got up by 22 points early in the second half. It got all the way down to three points. I started to get worried quarter. when they called that stupid jump ball after it went off Louisville. Of course, Louisville goes down, drains a three, and then I'm pretty sure Citron gets called for a charge after that. And then they go down and get another. It was like five points off very questionable calls there. And I was like, well, if they're crumbling and the refs are making questionable mm -hmm. calls, this is not going to bode well for them. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Jess, you were talking about the – like Louisville – that's one thing that they do well, like the switching, you know, like the defensive yeah. switching and, and stuff like that. And that can throw you off. Obviously it wasn't throwing Notre Dame off for, for more than a half of the game. And then, you know, like people were talking, you know, like just some of the comments and stuff like that between here. And I saw some of the boards after we got back here to the hotel about how oh, Notre Dame's hesitant, all this different, like Louisville's a really good defensive team. Oh, Let's sure, not yeah. forget Louisville beat Notre Dame a month ago down there. Right. In well, and, and, yeah, and it's still hard for Notre Dame mentally to have to play the same team back to back. And let's let's Louisville is still a good national team. They're only one loss behind Notre Dame in conference play and yeah. overall record, I believe. So it's not like this is just a walk in the park team. This is a good Louisville team. Right. And talking with Michaela Mabry, fighting Irish assistant, she came out for the post game like she was in charge of putting together the scouting report again. And she talked about like. There's a lot of familiarity between Notre Dame and Louisville. They are big rivals. This is the third time they've met this year. It's the sixth time in the last two seasons they have met. And because there's so much familiarity, you kind of, she said, like, they kind of find themselves like, you know, like you make adjustments. The fact that you played each other five days ago means you're making adjustments to the adjustments and you're kind of both second guessing yourself and out guessing yourself sometimes it's like, well, what are the, you know, what are they going to do? And then right. what do we have to do? What's and the then, counter to the counter, right? The counter to the counter, you know, what moves do you make and all that kind of stuff. So they won. That's all that matters. They're playing yes. Virginia tech tomorrow. No Kitley that with no Elizabeth Kitley, presumably she, the, the ACC three time player of the year didn't play for Virginia tech today. They squeaked out a win over Miami yeah, she, she is here. They're they're basically in the situation that Notre Dame was in with Olivia Miles last year. Is Kitley going to play? Is she not? She didn't play today. She wasn't limping when she walked out, but, you know, so who knows in terms if they would even try to play her tomorrow. For them, I think it's important just that they won today without her, but uh, it'll it be a different kind of game. matchup tomorrow. Their point guard, Georgia Amor, scored like half of their point, almost half their points in their win over Miami today. But I'll say this for Notre Dame, uh, by winning this game, I think that they have pretty much secured themselves hosting NCAA tournament games by winning today because they've won six straight now. The last three have been over ranked teams. Tomorrow, if they win, would be a fourth straight win over a ranked team because they, you know, this stretch now that is basically Louisville and Virginia Tech in four straight games, you know, twice each, I think every win they get right now inches them closer to potentially a three seed in the NCAA tournament versus being a four Ooh. seed. And obviously what that means, if you can get that three instead of four, you don't You're have to go one. through a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. You know, you'd go through a two seed instead. So if they can, if they can win again tomorrow and get to the ACC championship game, I think that they almost have secured themselves a number three seed potentially. So it's looking really good. It's looking really good right now. Um, I thought this was funny. Come on. I think Jesse guaranteed Notre Dame would win by 10 and they didn't. Can you please explain to my six wives whether alimony won't be said? Hey, nine is close. I was, I was, I said 10. I will, I will take nine. So Salty was asking if the women's tournament ended now, what seating would the Irish receive in the in the NCAA tournament? Again, I think they're a four they're a four seed borderline three right now. 
they win tomorrow, that's four consecutive wins over ranked teams because, you know, again. You're saying they win the whole thing. That's a three. If, if they win the whole thing, I think they're a lock for a three seed. So I think that that, that bodes Wouldn't really you argue, well. too, that they have one of the best out-of-conference resumes? Well, yeah, I mean, they've, they've got a net ranking of eight coming into this thing, you know. And, again, they've won six straight games. The last three have been over ranked teams. And among the six consecutive wins they have is also a win over Duke, who is, I think, just a couple spots behind Notre Dame in the net rankings right now. So there's a lot of quality that they're stacking. They're getting hot at the right time, which is which is obviously very important. Andre said, watch the Notre Dame women play well, but Louisville is very good. Physical game, too many foul calls. Virginia Tech, Notre Dame will be a battle. Should be, but I like I really like Notre Dame in the matchup because – Virginia Tech, their guard. We talked about this last week. Their guards are just so much less athletic than what they got from Louisville. They're not going to be nearly as physical. Virginia Tech, not nearly as physical, especially if they don't have Kitley. So, yeah, obviously, still can't take them for granted. They won today, you know, but um, they won't be nearly as physical. There was Jason. Jay, I think he's joking here. He says, you mean, because he's got like the laughing emojis. He says, you mean the Ian Book that won his, has a Super Bowl ring in his trophy case. That he a runner-up no Super part. Bowl ring as as the number three quarterback on the scout team. Yes. The, yeah, that wasn't even dressed for the game and had literally nothing to do with it. Got it. Him and right. the secretary probably have matching rings. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Andre asked this question he said josh pate put on how he would realign college football conferences did you see it what do you think i have not seen it i'll just say this i mean i think we'd all i think i know what he said hang on like see see if you can find it jess and throw a screenshot i mean it doesn't matter what josh pate or anyone else wants to do (laughs) because no one's going to realign right now because it's 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 all about the tv money you know it's like we can play pie in the sky games all we want but you know the only thing that's going to happen is the SEC and the Big Ten keep adding to a point. You know, no one's going to reshuffle right now. We can all dream if we want, but it's it's not going to happen. Let me know if you find it, Jess. Oh, oh, there it is. Jesse's got it. So what have we got here? I thought you'd like this because the Big Eight would be back. Oh, I can barely see it. Let me see if I can zoom <laughs> this in here. Go, uh, go full screen with it, with the whole yeah. thing. That'll help. Yeah. I mean, it looks great. This is basically, <laughs> um, you know, he's got the, you know, the Pac-10, the Southwest Conference. is the, This is basically the old conferences. <laughs> I love the Big East is back. I love yeah. the Big East. This is like pre-Big 12, pre-Big 10 expansion, all that kind of stuff. It'd be awesome, but it's never going to happen. So right. <laughs> where are we wasting any time even thinking about it? I like how Northwestern and Vanderbilt are both independent now all of a sudden because nobody wants them. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so what's this this about here? Crying oh crying belly is back. We haven't seen I was getting you, you know, it is really funny because as soon as we got into all this con this quarterback talk, all I could think of was crying belly, and sure enough. There he is. Here we go, baby. He's laying Stir laying the pot. in the sidelines, just waiting to jump in. Here he comes. Here I mean, he comes. I, I hope he takes his meds because he's going to be real depressed after this because he's a very – he's just, just very negative. Just very <laughs> negative. So Crying says he will make me eat crow when he is sub-50% completion rate against Texas A&M and reports show that Angeli is beating him in practice all spring. Uh, long, but he's crowned the starter anyway by this coaching staff. I'm so, telling you right now, he will not outplay Riley Leonard in the spring. It's not going to happen, dude. And he just said that he's prophetic. You're not prophetic. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's, trying to, he's trying to draw uh, comparisons to saying that Sam Hartman is this is Sam Hartman all over again, and Sam Hartman right. against right. Louisville and et cetera and et cetera. Just completely different. Kind of, like the one thing I will give Crying is you know like he was he was in here crying about. Sam Hartman and his all in, all his interceptions after he transferred in a year ago, those did turn out to be pretty crucial during the season. I will give him that. You know, like he was concerned about Hartman's interceptions. Hartman's interceptions were, you know, but I just I I apples and oranges. I just don't see it applying to anything 
with Riley Leonard. Everyone yeah. argued with me when I told you last offseason Hartman was going to have five turnovers against Louisville. I mean, it's valid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really it became prophetic in one game. I mean, look, Sam Hartman isn't what everybody thought he was going to be. Okay, I'll give that to you. But, like, man, it's just – it must just be a rough life just being negative all the time. Just be happy, man. We get to watch college football. That's all I want. Yeah. I, I don't understand, Mr. Cry and Belly. Yeah, it just it, why be a fan if you're constantly going to be miserable? Yeah, I mean, he's saying you know less experience, more hype. Eight and four, here we come. No, nope, not mean, one it, person ever said that that Sam Hartman was going to be a first round draft pick in the NFL. Right. This time last year, that was absolutely the case with Riley Leonard. Right. Go back and look. So it's a different conversation, man. It's a different conversation i'm sorry just is well and sam was still better than what was in the room you know that's really all i can he was the best option in the room so i don't know what else they're playing the best they got no and scott you know this is true as well leonard's going to have a better team around him you know look at what they've done in the transfer portal go out you know the the receivers they've got yep whether or not it's still kind of waiting to see i think the offense hopefully better coaches line is going to be the yeah, offensive okay. line may not be better. I mean, we'll right. see what happens. And, right. that, and that's that's my point. I mean, yeah. I think they'll still be good, but there's right. going to be some growing pains because you're going to have a lot of inexperience out there. And that's something that you can take for granted when you've got two NFL caliber tackles out there with all the experience that Alton Fisher had. You can take that for granted. And as much talent as these other guys have, they still have to get out there and get their feet thrown to the fire. And that affects the quarterback as well. So let's – you know, remember that, that Hartman did have, you know, pretty good offensive line in front of him out there last well, season. And, you know, <laughs> he says that Sam Hartman should have been benched after the Tennessee State game. You know, the one where he went 14 of 17 with two touchdowns. <laughs> right. You know, two and like two quarters, right? Half. Because they let Angeli play the second half and he was just so right. much better than him up here. Right. Okay. I mean, come on, dude. That, see, now it, your your argument just went from negative You're exposing to, yourself. You're nuts. exposing yourself. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. How can you be better than 14 of 17? Like, okay, sorry, he missed three passes. Like, come on, man. Yeah. Anyway, it's fine. It's all good. It's all – This is why we're here, to have this discussion, to debate. And I, I will 100% agree that Riley Leonard is going to have better talent around him. As far as from a skill position standpoint, there I don't think there's any doubt about that. I will also say that he's going to have a better offensive coordinator as yes. well. There's no doubt about that. And, and so, definitely a wide receiver coach that's better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Coaching yeah. staff all around him is going to be better. And Plus so, the receivers. If, if no, I mean Riley Leonard might be overhyped, you know. He might like, be. But, but but he is going to have one, he's going to have better talent around him than he had. Yep. at Duke, and he's got all those other factors in his favor as well. You've already got a better wide receiver coach. I don't think it took very long you know, for you guys at the practice yesterday, based on what I've heard, just to kind of see that there's a different feel for what's going yeah. on with those wide receivers, plus the fact that you've got you know, a, a, a different dynamic with those wide – just the transfers alone, I think what they're going to bring. Yeah. Still a lot of promise with the young guys – Give me Cam well. Williams, baby. I saw him. Up <laughs> everyone's, out there. everyone's on the Cam you know Williams train. He wasn't even the best freshman wide receiver out there. Was it was. Uh, Martin? Mike, Mike Gilbert? Gilbert. Gilbert, sorry. Yeah. Mike, Mike Gilbert outplayed Cam Williams yesterday. No doubt oh boy. about it. We're going to have freshman wide receiver arguments for the second year in a row. Hey, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. So, again, one practice. So, you know, take what you want to from one practice, and that's fine. But, you know. It is what it is. How about Notre Dame men's basketball? They, you know, kind of tumbled a little bit against North Carolina this week. But if they make the NIT, do you buy or sell that as a big accomplishment for the Notre Dame men? Vince and I talked about this a little bit uh, in rapid fire on Wednesday. It, it, basically, the, the, the question was posed, does getting dominated by North Carolina take away anything from the season and, and how they've ended the season here on that winning streak? And I said no, and then we started talking about the NIT. They would be a hard out in the NIT because of how they play defense, and I think no one in the NIT has shown up 
uh, excited to have to play a defensive war, but Notre Dame would love it <laughs> and they would eat it up. And so, you know, I do think it would be a big deal and I think Notre Dame would perform well and I think it would help them even more in terms of confidence going in to next season, showing kind of the fruits of the labor of, hey, we didn't make the NCAA tournament, but we made the NIT. And this is, you know, we gave teams a lot of fits with how we play. You add in offense and they're just going to be a much better team. Yeah, the, the, it would be a huge, huge deal for them to get into the NIT, especially after what happened in the first half of the year. I mean, this team, this team is rough. This team is very rough, okay? And if you had told me in December this team was going to be in the NIT, I'd have asked you what you were drinking and can I have some. Like, there's no chance that I thought that they would make the NIT. And I agree with Jesse. If they make it into the NIT, they are going to be a very tough out. I, I, I think so, too. I am excited if they happen to get in, and I think that's still a big if, if they happen to get in, I will be watching with anxious anticipation to see how they do. See, and that's that's why I think just getting, if they can get into the NIT, it would be a big accomplishment because it is still a big if just for them to get there. I mean, I think there'll be a tough out in the first couple rounds of the ACC tournament, just the way they're playing right now. They feel like they've got a little bit different level of confidence. I think that this is all you can ask for from this team, that as this season has gone along, there was a point where they easily could have cashed it in there in uh, you know late January and early February when they couldn't win a game. And to, to, to win, what is it, five of their last seven, I guess yeah. now, after the loss to North Carolina. I mean, North Carolina – is a good team. And, it, you know, I don't, I don't think you can write them off just because they went to North Carolina and couldn't beat the Tar Heels. So I think it would be a huge accomplishment if they could get into the NIT. And, I, you know, it would just be, I think that that would be a nice little capper to this season if they could somehow find their way in there. CBI? I don't know. NIT? Yes. Forget NIT and one mixtape tour should be the goal. <laughs> they still have that? <laughs> I thought that was funny. I don't know. I did not find this funny, by the way. Scott says, we've arrived at gaming up on Jesse. Have we arrived at the ganging up on Jesse part of the show? If so, let me just say it's a good thing he has a girlfriend because he's never going to get one with that stash. <laughs> Ouch. Man. Ouch. I made, I, mean, I made a comment yesterday, Vince, and everyone said it was my best take ever on this show, and it had nothing to do with Notre Dame. So wow. I think that shows where we're at. What 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 was the take? I gotta know. I, I I said that MMA and UFC has ruined professional boxing. Yes, that's fair. Yeah, Vince, that's fair. let me ask you this: Did oh, you boy. did you see Mike Tyson is going to come out of retirement at age fifty seven and fight <laughs> Jake Paul? I also saw him. Uh, they showed video of him walking with a cane. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'll tell you what, I still believe he'll beat Jake Paul even yes. with a cane. But um, I. Even if I would, like, I would still like if it was pay per view at this point right now. I would drop fifty bucks, even if I, you know, had to watch. It's gonna be on Netflix. Walk, walk into the Netflix? ring. With the cane. It is Netflix. on Netflix. Like, are live? you at least interested in this, though, Vince? You know, you're not a boxing guy. I'm are you not. interested in Mike Tyson, <laughs> Jake Paul at all? I would watch it because I want to see Jake okay. Paul get his butt kicked. That's what I said yesterday. It'd be nice to see Jake Paul get knocked out. Nice. Yeah. Over under. That's right. That's One right, DK. Half. Mike Tyson don't need to walk. <laughs> he just needs these, and it's going to be rough, man. That's right. That's right. A lion can still kill with no legs. <laughs> <laughs> um. Shoot. Oh, I was going to say, over under one and a half hallucinogens that Tyson is on during that fight. There's no way he's walking in that ring cold stone just <laughs> sober. He's got to be on something in there. You think they, they've got to do drug tests before those things, though, <laughs> I don't right? No. <laughs> it's not for like a belt or anything. It's for money. It's it's for Netflix. That's true. Crying says he's still waiting on the thousand yard season from Merriweather. Well, I guess you can watch ACC football this uh Yep, this we're fall. all waiting. You can watch, you can watch Cal waiting. all you want in their first season in the ACC. <laughs> yep. so see if he, we're all still waiting. See if he gets that thousand yard season. Yes, we'll all be waiting together for that. So, with the men's and women's NCAA tournaments on the horizon, the women's game is as popular, I think, as it's ever been right now. You know, largely because of Caitlin Clark and the whole Caitlin Clark phenomena that really 
really got started with them getting to the national championship game last year. But you've got Angel Reese, you've got Hannah Hidalgo, you've got Juju Watkins out at USC and, you know, among other players as well. So my question to you, because I've kind of heard this pop up in the last week or two, do you think the lack of big names on the men's side is going to impact interest Mm. in the men's NCAA tournament this year? No, I don't. And here's why I say that, because the men's tournament is already established. It's the men's tournament. Everybody gets excited about March Madness. Everybody wants to fill out a bracket. Everybody does. You know, people are still going to take off work. All of those different that that's all going to happen. And it doesn't matter who's playing. It just doesn't. Now, it's always nice to have a Cinderella or something along those lines to kind of pique some more interest. But it's just it's such an established event that I don't think it matters if there's no marquee people involved. I think the women's game needs some marquee people. And I think it's very helpful that that is the case because it brings eyeballs to the women's game. And then they see that, oh, wow, this is actually a good product. But that's not where the men's game is right now. That's not where March Madness for the men is. That's where the women's game is. Can you uh, very well said, Vince, can you give me the question again, please? (laughs) Oh I gotta God. make sure I top Vince here. He he was. Do you think the lack of big names in the men's game will impact interest in the men's NCAA basketball tournament in comparison to the women's this year? No, and I think that the women are more driven around, or more so, need uh, and comparatively to men need the names to 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 draw people in. To the tournament, but I think that in in terms of the men's side, like Vince was kind of getting at, is people buy into March Madness no matter who the players are, Mm -hmm. who the teams are. People want to fill out a bracket and they want to be able to be distracted from work and they want to see big upsets, etc. etc. I don't think it matters the player anymore in college, it matters maybe you know, once you get down to the elite eight and you have better teams and you start seeing some of these you know, bigger, bigger name type lottery players uh, in terms of the men's game, but the women need Caitlin Clark. They need Sabrina Inesco. They need, you know, Jackie Young, uh, Hannah Hidalgo type players, because that is what's going to get interest from fans. People don't naturally say, let me go watch this women's game for the heck of it. Like they do with men's March madness. They tune in specifically to see a player that is polarizing. Bottom line is, the men's the men's tournament gets so much interest. It has nothing to do with the players on TV. It's about the brackets. Everybody fills out a bracket yep. on the men's side, and you've got your pools, whether it's online or in your office or wherever it happens to be. The men's tournament's about the bracket. That's where the interest comes in. Shocker, gambling, money on the line. You know, that's that's what sucks people in. And that's why there's so much interest on the men's side. It, it doesn't matter who the actual players are happened to be now in terms of final four viewership you know just like last year you didn't have the blue bloods in there right like you know and even when you get to that if you have a couple blue bloods in the men's final four at the end of things that will still get you a little bit of a number the women's is as as you guys both said the women's side needs these stars to get people to sample the game. People still aren't going to do office pools, you know, with women's brackets. That's just not what people do, but to, you know, you can still draw them in with the fact that you have Caitlin Clark's and Hannah Hidalgo's and, and, you know, on down the line that that'll get, that'll get people at least interested in the women's tournament. And again, it's really not going to be like the women's game still really needs Caitlin Clark to at least get to the final four. Oh, once again, like to, I was gonna you know, to get a big number yeah. at the end of, of the rainbow. Yeah. I completely agree with that. I think, you know, the, the NCAA tournament would be the women's side would be uh, for all of those individuals to make a bit of a run, you know, Hannah Hidalgo, she's going to be one of those people, right? Uh, Caitlin Clark, the, the gal from USC, like all of, you want those names to continue on absolutely right. so that they don't lose interest in the tournament. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Seven Mule says he'd rather watch uh, women's basketball because it's about basketball, not getting to the NBA and still pure team basketball, better basketball, in my opinion. And really, I think, you know, there's there's 
I think the men's game has steadily declined over the last several years. Really, Same. you know, since since one and done, you see a lot less. You know, there's just a lot less team cohesion, and the transfer portal obviously has not helped anything along those lines. Whereas in the women's side, you still have the majority of women staying four and even five years, you know, like Elizabeth Kitley, for example, at Virginia Tech, the ACC three-time player of the year. She's three times because she got the fifth year, you know, by staying for a fifth year. And, Two in my books. Yeah, well, I, I don't I don't disagree. But yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's there's there's just the, the I think the women's product has continually gotten a lot better because of the fact that you've got that cohesion and the fact that you've got stars who are taking it to another level helps as well. Joe says, Jesse, so you're saying gambling rules men's sports. Personally, I miss watching players develop anticipating the matchups. Money rules everything, Joe. Money rules mm -hmm. everything. Yep. That's, I mean, that's why there were people seated in front of me on press <laughs> row at the uh, AC Oh, here we go. Today. Back to the press row. <laughs> uh, Joe did jump in. He said, wait, are you guys earlier? Has the time changed that I missed it? Fridays, we start at 5 o'clock. For people who aren't used to uh, coming in, Fridays is a 5 o'clock show and not a 6 o'clock show. So yep. personally, I think we have all agreed before, we would love to start at 5 every day if we could, but <laughs> we stick with 6 o'clock. So <laughs> that's just the way it goes. Fill in the blank. It's blank that Fox Sports is going to feature a primetime college football game on the main Fox broadcast broadcast channel every Friday night starting this fall. It is tragedy that they're going to do Friday night. It's absolute tragedy. I, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm a traditionalist, but Friday night's for high school. It's not for college. And it makes me upset that they're going to do Friday night games. Like, honestly, any other week, any other day of the week is fair game for college Same. football as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned. Not Friday nights. Not Fridays. I got to echo what Vince says, unfortunately, here. Um, Friday nights is for high school. And I agree that it should be the only untouched. I don't care about Mac on Monday or right. Big West on Wednesday. But Friday is always high school. You got to let the high school kids shine, have their yep. own day. And, you know, I, I get why they're doing it, right? Because it's like, oh, how do we suck more? Um, you know, eyeballs to the screen on, you know, another day of the week. And, you know, so we don't have to worry about all the other games that are going on on Saturday. So I get it, but it's just so stupid. Yeah, I don't like it. I, there, we're, I, I believe that there's a problem with attendance at high school games as it is. And if you're going to put high quality college football on, there's going to be even less butts in the stands. Right. That's the best part about Friday night yeah. is having your community. Exactly. Well, it's just the community. You're exactly. There. There has been a lot, you know, a long-standing agreement, you know, sort of a gentleman's agreement. Not that they had to between the NFL and college that they would not encroach on Friday yeah. night because of everything that you guys are talking about. And it's just, you know, like the guys on Friday night. Obviously, not all of them get to college, but you get to college starting off by playing on yeah. Friday nights, and that's 100%. you know, it's like community events and all that. You know, like everyone. You know, at the community level and everything else, that's that's where it's supposed to be. And these are going to be between the Big Ten, the Big 12, and the Mountain West are going to be these Friday night games. I mean, obviously, it's going to be good for Fox. It's going to be good, you know, for, you know, like sports bars and stuff like that because you're going to have, you know, like like if you come in town for a Notre Dame weekend and people are, are out, it's going to be great. It's like, oh, we got a football game on Friday sure. night. People are obviously – gonna love that i think it's gonna be best for you know like the the illinois kansas indiana purdue like these mid-level power fives to you know to be able to get a national broadcast a standalone broadcast on a friday night you're gonna have sure. more people watching it but i just don't think that it is good for you know just just in general because of all the things that you talked about because you're robbing attention from the high school kids yeah, you, they need to keep that attention on Friday nights. That's where it's supposed to be. I thought this was a really good take here from Michael Campbell. Must be because he's a Cowboys fan. We're all the intellects. <laughs> I get it. But it's disrespectful for parents of players, especially 
who have high school and college football kids. I didn't think of that aspect, you know, like you got a lot, a lot of families have kids who are still playing in high school and also right. in college. And now you're, you know, you're splitting them up. I'm sure one parent's staying, one parent's going, et cetera, true too. et cetera. It's yeah, just, the fact it's that you more have to travel, like if families. you got multiple kids and one's in college, you know, you want to go away to see that, but you also want to see your other kid play on Friday night too. So, yep. hundred yes. percent. I love high school football. I, even after my kid gets done playing, I love high school football. I think one of my daughters probably going to end up being a cheerleader. I mean, it's 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 high school football, man. Like, right. to me, that's untouchable. Don't mess with high school football. It's still where, well, for the most part, it's still where it's just pure football and excitement and all right. of that, right? But, you it's know. Nothing like a Friday night game, man. Fox is, they're all, they're all looking for ways to recoup their yeah. money now. They've shelled out this big money to the Big Ten. And, you know, they're giving decent money to the Big 12 as well, but they all are trying to get more return on their dollar. And they're just, you know, it's it's all about how you can, you know, capitalize. And, oh, we can own Friday night. Now we can own the 12 o'clock window on Saturday. And then we've got, you know, we can own Sunday as well because we've got the NFL. You know, that's that's basically. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. They're patting themselves on the back, you know, and I guess rightfully so because people are going to watch it. But I just I don't I don't think it's. I, don't, I, I think the majority of people don't think it's probably a good idea. I would hope not. But the problem is the money's going to talk and eyeballs on the screen are going to talk and there's going to be people that are going to be watching these games. Right. And it's just there's nothing good about it, in my opinion, from a fan standpoint. But they don't they didn't ask me. Yep. Scott, appreciate the super chat. Thanks for dropping that in for us on this Friday. We had a hundred dollar super chat. Yesterday, Vince. There was another super chat in there, wasn't there? Uh, was there one? I, I thought that there was one earlier. That we was the one. one that I saw just now. I we thought there were two. Up. We pulled one up earlier. Oh, must have been when I was daydreaming. <laughs> and you wonder why people give you a hard time. Seriously. Like, I'm the true squirrel, baby. My brain is, huh? 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 <laughs> All right. If you're uh, in Greensboro... Tomorrow, IB Nation, roll out. The, uh, <laughs> you need to play this is the opening to Entourage as you guys IB roll Posse. up on the court. That's right. Seriously. <laughs> the problem is that guy was wearing maroon. That means he's a Virginia Tech fan. He was a Virginia Tech fan. His oh, wife had a – yeah, they were wearing no. Virginia Tech gear. You know, So they so weren't know, even there. A tough like, day the tomorrow for them. You know, they were there for our game. Yeah, and that's, what, that's the first thing I wondered when we were leaving. It's like, oh, are they going to be there again? tomorrow so but don't necessarily sit in the same spot every day so i might be someplace oh else. that's a good point there'll be there'll still be people in front of those other spots it'll just be a matter of how tall they are just so. ask for the nosebleed seats man <laughs> just go up high seriously all good ryan ryan roberts asking if he saw a crying belly in here you did you did right oh yeah you did he brought he brought he was the fire, asking for fire, you fire. actually Ryan, he had things to say about you that you probably don't want to know about. <laughs> Him and Salty were actually, uh, it was like the Malta conference. They were getting together and and uh, figuring out things that they could come after you for. All right, well, that's going to do it for tonight. Again, we've got Notre Dame women's basketball, a couple games, hopefully, this weekend. Semifinals tomorrow against Virginia Tech and just Go look Irish. at it like if you're an Irish fan, every win that they pick up, you know, gets them uh, closer to to most likely securing NCAA tournament home games in the first couple rounds. So, 100%. That's what we got going. All right. For Jesse and Vince, I'm Sean. Hit the like button before you leave. And, of course, subscribe, rate, and review. And have a great weekend. And we will talk to you Monday on IB Nation Sports. Goodbye. <laughs>